Good afternoon, everybody. I'm your host, Crystal. This is another edition of the 9 O'Clock Meltdown podcast. And on the computer, I have the very talented and fabulous Vernon Williams of Tubular Studios and Gaelic Leather Works. Hello, sir. Howdy, howdy. <laughs> Wonderful. And now, you and I met, oh, probably about 10 years ago now, oddly enough, at church. And, yeah, uh, that was really kind of a funny thing. <laughs> yes, I, I think it's hilarious because both of us are covered in tattoos and we don't really go to church, but we met at church. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not a church fearing person, but they said, hey, we'll pay you to go. And I'm like, cool, I'll be there. Right, exactly. Uh, same, <laughs> same. So I was uh, kind of your underling for a bit there, and you taught me a bunch about the soundboard and cables and everything like that. And kind of through that, I learned that you are, that's kind of what you do. You do sound and lights and events and everything else. And then recently, I learned that you also do leather work as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So which one do you want to jump into first? Oh, take it where you will. I mean, (laughs) I'm, I'm an open book. All right. Perfect. Let's jump into the sound and lighting first. Now, you went to school for it. I know that much. But how did you... How did you get interested in this path? You know, for me personally, I just kind of fell into it, uh, kind of filling a need at some coffee shops and stuff like that. But what does your path look like, sir? I initially started in eighth grade. There was a, what they called tech crew, and down in Burnsville. And basically what tech crew did is they set up the technical stuff for our school dances. And uh, because our our school dances were held in our cafeteria, which is our cafeteria slash auditorium, and they would, I would literally set up the lights and sound, and then they would also have, uh, they would do theater in our cafeteria, so, um, because bleachers would pull out and go from there, and... I got, I saw it, and I'm like, okay, this sounds like cool. I'd always been interested in electronics and whatnot. And started doing it then, doing, you know, setting up the school dances and setting up sound, and and that's kind of where I got into the DJing aspect of my audio career. And from there, one day, uh, or one of the shows we did was Annie Jr., and they didn't have enough equipment. Our school didn't have enough equipment, so they borrowed some equipment from the high school, that was a couple miles away and they brought in a Mackie 328 and I said yep I'll run soundboard I'll, I volunteered for it just on a whim and uh, when they brought that board in I was like holy Hannah and uh, after that I was I was pretty much hooked and the rest is kind of history and that was the very origins of, of me getting into the audio business um, and I ran audio pretty much from Oh, heck, when was that? That would have been my eighth grade year, so that would have been 97, 98. Yeah, the beginning of 97 all the way through 98 is when I, I started doing that. So I'd been sitting in front of a soundboard since 98, and the first one that I jumped into wasn't just this little Mamby Pamby, you know, three or four channel board or even a 10 channel board. Uh, for most kids in high school, no, I sat in front of a 32 channel board uh, <laughs> and went from there. Mm-hmm. So I, I used that board all the way through high school because uh, I went back to the high school and I used it all the way up until the day I graduated. Nice, nice. Sounds like you've had a, a lot of experience with boards and things like that. I know for me, you know, I started out kind of more on the analog board with just the knobs and, you know, you hook up the cable here and blah, da 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 And now everything's done wireless and from an iPad, which still kind of daunts me a little bit. I, I think I like the physicality of things a little bit more. But it's, it's really funny because when I was dating my wife at the time, I was actually in college for audio engineering. I was a I was moonlighting uh, as a tow truck driver for overnights. Oh. And my wife actually said like, she was in the tow truck with me because uh, that was kind of the only way we could actually see each other, really. And uh, she actually said, so if I ever want to see you, I'm going to need to learn this stuff, right? And I kind of went, yeah, you're probably going to need to learn some of it. So she borrowed a couple of my textbooks and uh, learned how to be an assistant engineer. And our first date was actually a wedding that I had was DJing. And I was out on the dance floor. And just before I jumped out to the dance floor, I said, when I point to you, press this button and do this and turn the volume up on the fader. She, she did it flawlessly. And so we were tag teaming it for the longest time uh, as, as DJs. And she would kind of run the sound and run the lights. And I would talk on the mic and do all of that stuff while I was doing other things. So it was 
it was pretty entertaining on that and that I got her kind of into that industry now. Mm-hmm. But she's exactly like you. Um, I run a digital board now. Um, I run a 32-channel digital, but she prefers the feel of analog and as well. So she'll actually push the faders up and mm-hmm. go from there. And so she has her own little small analog board um, and was actually just recently down at the deck uh, doing dance recitals for the last month and a half. Oh. So she's been down there running the sound mm-hmm. while, the, uh, while the company I, I, I manage was doing the lights. So we, we just tag teamed it and, and go from there. So, yeah, so I totally get what you're feeling on that. And with, you know, you got to have that analog. You actually like the feeling of the fader under your fingers and going from there. I know a, a few people have asked me throughout the years, oh, y- you've done sound, right? Here, and they'll hand me the iPad and I'm like, ah, no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's 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 not that big of a leap. It really is more just to feel on it on that end. There are some out there that I feel some 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 sound programs out there that I feel are way too powerful. The the smaller ones, uh, or for the the people that don't do it as often. But then there are ones that are a lot simpler on that end that are a lot more user friendly. So, like, if, if you probably were familiar with the, the Behringer X Air. Yeah. And that's probably that 90% of the people in, in Duluth are using are the X Airs. Mm-hmm. And I find that they're just vastly overpowered um, and vastly overcomplicated. Mm-hmm. Um, and you really have to know a lot about it to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, where I use a Mackie, uh, I use the Mackie app uh, with my system, and it is vastly simpler and vastly easier to use. Mm-hmm. Um, there's not any fighting with it. It's very simple, very clean. It's no frills. Mm-hmm. None of these extra frills that Behringer has. And uh, a lot of people look at it, the Behringer, and they're like, oh, yeah, we got this and this and this. And I'm you're kind of going, okay, well, you don't need this, 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 and this. You just need this. And I've had people borrow an X Air and they're like, this is way too complicated. And then they sit, they borrow mine uh, running Mackie and they come back and they're like, oh my God, this was so much easier. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> and they're, they're, they're hooked on it. So it's, it's really nice on that. Mm-hmm. End. Yeah. Vern, I, like I know, cause I've known you personally for 10 years, but even in that statement, you've got this vast knowledge of almost everything and anything. Um, does that come from being self-taught or does that come from just kind of diving in head first and mucking about and seeing what sticks some of it is diving in and seeing what sticks and some of it is being just poor this <laughs> 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 is the best way i can describe it i mean working on as a side hobby i work on classic cars um and restore classic cars and that was that was born uh from my wife because she was very much so into classic cars because of her father. And so I got into the classic car aspect that way. But fixing cars, when I first moved to Duluth, I found very, 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 very quickly that you need to know someone who knows someone whose brother, sister's brother's best friend's best friend's boyfriend's dad owned a shop back in the 70s. And that's how you got a job. And I didn't have any of that when I moved up here. Um, so it took me a very long time to, to get something uh, or to even find a job. Mm-hmm. And that lended me the aspect of, you know, I wasn't able to work on, on anything. I wasn't able to afford to have somebody fix something. So I had to learn how to fix it myself. Mm -hmm. Um, so a lot of my experience in things has been out of necessity Mm -hmm. on that end, but I was also a boy scout. So I, I had a good foundation on, on other things as well, Uh, you know, fixing things around the house, basics, changing tires, doing all of that stuff, you know, running electrical work and stuff like that, you know, plumbing, stuff like that, just from merit badges, being a boy scout. Yeah, but then, uh, but the majority of the stuff was was really born out of necessity and just being broke and just not having the ability to to be able to do it by myself. Being able to do it by myself, excuse me, mm-hmm. um, because I couldn't afford it to have a professional deal with it. Now I'm learning even more facets about you. So you you run a sound and light studio. Now you work on classic cars and you also do leather work. Is there anything you don't do? Um. <laughs> Long pause. I'll take that as a no. Yeah, that, that, <laughs> no, but yeah, you, you really have to, really have to think about it. I mean, it's like I've I've had to deal with with the muck and and grime and crud of anything and everything that life can throw at you. I mean, I haven't jumped out of an airplane yet. Um, <laughs> that's on the bucket I mean, list, I right? Haven't gone skydiving yet, but I mean, it is something that's like <laughs> you know, I, I I wouldn't mind doing it, but mm-hmm. it's like. I haven't had the opportunity <laughs> so um type of a thing you know i don't do skateboarding I used to do rollerblading quite a bit and then i learned that uh over time my the, one of my hip 
hip joints is actually one of my legs is actually shortened a little bit so i actually have i, I can't rollerblade anymore because i end up giving myself excruciating hip pain so it's oh. like oh, crap um so it's just one of those things where it's like hmm but i was really good at ice skating and and rollerblading mm. um in my younger years um but yeah, no, there's not really a whole heck of a lot that I don't know at least something about. Right. <laughs> That's wonderful. So let's talk a little bit more about Tubular Studios. Um, how did you come up with the name? Was it kind of hard to get it launched off the ground? What was what were those early days like? Well, I had initially, I went to school for audio engineering. Most of my teachers were uh, Grammy nominated and in the music industry, uh, Tom Tucker, uh, senior was uh, founded uh, Master Mix Studios down in Minneapolis, and he actually he ran Paisley Park. I believe it was from the late I want to say it was from the the mid to late eighties all the way through the nineties. Um, he managed Paisley Park and, and worked with Prince very closely. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, my best man at my wedding uh, was a uh, was an engineer was one of my teachers, and he actually. Um, he was Grammy nominated for working on one of Soul Asylum's albums, and uh, and going from there. So I mean, a lot of my teachers were that way, and so I got a really good foundation for the music industry at that point. And then when I moved up here, that's when I kind of I have one of my one of my best friend actually was going to a business conference down at the deck and said, "Hey, do you want to come with me?" And I said, "Sure." And so at that point, that's when Tubular Studios, you know, came into flourishing officially, according to the government. The name Tubular Studios. I, I actually got from from uh, the artist Mike Oldfield is where it originated from uh, because he had I, I've always been a fan of his music and uh, there's an album that's called Songs of a Distant Earth that I, I got hooked very young back when I was in high school and it was just it, it really if, if you don't get a chance to to listen to it it's a really amazing album not a lot of um, it's it's very ethereal in it but it, it has different you, you basically have it has different facets of, of the world uh, and world music which is really awesome but uh mike oldfield also scored the um the, the music for the exorcist the name of the song that was really popular back in the 70s tubular bells and so that's where i got tubular from and then instead of having like productions or anything like that i just said you know what i'm not I don't produce. I'm just a studio for people to, to record, and I record them. So I just opted for studios instead of productions. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that was it hard to get your footing here in Duluth, or did you already have those connections with tubular studios? Oh, no, no. I, I had to. I had to go everything dead stick. Mm -hmm. I had zero connections in this town. Really, the only connection I had is for my final project. I actually came up here one day. Because on, it was on a Friday, uh, because my wife had, had suggested because I needed to record an entire band mm -hmm. um, and engine and mix one song, and so I actually came up here, and uh, my wife suggested there was a band called Super D and the Double Chucks, and they were they they were a formation of a band that it was Darren Wallace. I can't remain no, I can't remember what what the other what the drummer's name was at the time. I can see his face perfectly. Uh, and then Barry Pericula and Barry actually played over lunch at down at Beaners uh, and, and whatnot. So he would play Beaners, which was really nice and awesome. Mm -hmm. So I'd never been to Duluth at all at that point. Um, came up here, my wife said, "Yeah, let's go up and have lunch and listen to Barry play." And so I actually at the end of it went and app approached him and, and asked him if, if he'd be cool if I did like a, a small demo or EP for them and do three or four songs you know as well you know because I could track them and mix them and uh, at the time the Super D and the Double Chucks is actually it was actually they lost their bass player um, and we're using a bass player uh, named Lefty yep Lefty has passed away or passed away a while a couple of several years ago um, but they were known as the Hood Owls go from there and it's like okay and the Hoot Owls, so I recorded the Hoot Owls, um, and that's how I got a little bit of a foot inside of Duluth. Uh, but that was really it. At that point, it really evolved. I, I started to approach different people here and there, and I, that's when I found out very quickly that this town and the music scene is very clicky. It, they don't like people. You have to be a certain way. And uh, I found that out, and so I kind of just took my business tubular and put it on a 
back burner um, and just kept a really low profile. Mm. Um, had some few, had a couple people that would record um, a couple songs here and there. I was portable so I could travel um, and go from there. But uh, never really did anything major until one day I actually went over to, I was doing some stuff on, it was called the venue at Mohawk Block over in Lincoln Park. I can't remember what the name of it used to be. Uh, it used to be the Knockout. That's what it was. Mm. It used to be the Knockout in Lincoln Park. Um, but then it became the venue at Mohawk Block. And I kind of got an in there, got my foot in the door, and uh, the new owners wanted to do a, a venue with that would run sound. And so I was running sound there and uh, did that for a couple of years. And then I got a uh, one of the people actually said, hey, you should check out Clyde Ironworks. And then from there, I went down to Clyde and they said, yeah, we got this person that's doing this and we're not a fan of it and looked at everything and said okay well I have a show that's I'm doing here for another band going on on this date and so I saw their system upstairs on the mezzanine level which isn't there anymore unfortunately they said yeah no you got some stuff here that's being funky I know how to run the lights I know how to run the sound and do all of that stuff and yeah I can tune it all up for you and they said cool let's make it happen um and then after that point it was kind of the hit it was kind of sent to history hmm. um where i was a house engineer over there for oh god pretty much until COVID hit the owner alex giuliani uh, pretty much said yeah i don't want anybody running the sound but you and because it always seemed that when they did homegrown or they'd have a band come in that i wasn't running the sound something would break on it and i'd have to fix it oh, geez. Um, <laughs> you know three-way speakers and you know the the you know, come back from homegrown and they'd be running everything so hot that all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, nope, the mids, the mid tweeters are, are blown on it. It's like, oh, okay, well I'll order up another mid tweeter. Mm -hmm. And you know, two of the four would be, would be shot. That's like, oh, no wonder this sounds weird. Mm -hmm. And go from there. Uh, so yeah, so it was, it, it really started up on that. And then once COVID hit, uh, well, actually when I was still DJing, kind of tying you into all of this, yeah. Um, when I was still at the house engineer down at Clyde, um, I was still DJing. This was back in 2000, 2007, 2008. Um, I was uh, DJing, and that's when I, I had officially started Tubular Studios in 2008. So yeah, I would have been probably 2008, uh, 2009 area. And I was, uh, the, I, my, the company I worked for actually got a phone call. I was down, I was a technical director, and they were doing work. They ended up uh, getting a phone call from First Luther Church asking if they knew of anybody that could do PA system. They actually wanted Pro Sound to do it, mm -hmm. uh, provide PA for their outdoor services. And they said, well, we don't do this, but I got a guy who does. And so they actually gave them my number. And so I actually went and put that in. They called me, and I talked to them, and I actually put together a quote to do the sound outside. And it was very <laughs> rudimentary because I was still broke. So they actually, I, I put in a quote and a bid for the entire summer uh, to do everything, which basically started my padding out of all of the equipment that I actually have. And so I actually was able to buy a snake, a board, all of this stuff, and, uh, and do it that way. And so from there, it was really rather funny because I don't know if you were around when April was still there. I thought you were, but April actually, April Larson came up to me fourth weekend out of the nine weeks and she goes, we're putting a new sound system in. No, yeah, you weren't there. She actually said, oh, yeah, she was. She actually said, um, you know, we're putting in a new sound system because we're remodeling the sanctuary. Is there any way that you can stick around and show somebody how to run the sound system? And I said, sure, yeah, well, you can just... We'll just do an hourly rate and just go from there. And uh, she's like, okay, sounds like a plan. And uh, really, I, at first looking, I was only initially meant to be there for like a month oh. to show people how to run the sound system. And I never left. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was there for maybe three years. And uh, yeah, then I bounced. So so I left. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think you were still there. You may, were, I don't know. I don't remember when you came in. I think you came in when April was still there, but then April left, and then it was Mark Pullman. Yes, if I remember correct. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, yep. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, I had been at First Lutheran for a very long time. I'm not their, I'm not their standard house engineer anymore. Um, so nobody monitors anything, but I still do their outdoor services. Mm -hmm. So I actually have those on the books for this summer. Uh, to do their outdoor services. Nice, nice. And I remember one time you you told me that. Someone up on the hill had actually called First Lutheran and said, "We can hear your service from our house. Turn it down." I, I there was, <laughs> and actually, this was a couple of years ago. It literally, it was last year. 
I was actually using my system and Bob was always one of those where he's like, yep, you can turn it up, turn it up, turn it up. Cause I want to be able to hear, you know, mm-hmm. at the end, at the end of the bowl down in, down at Lee Barracks. And I was like, okay, cool. But by the bike path. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I was, um, so two years ago, I was actually sitting up. Uh, I engineer from the way up on a bench up by the bike path now over by the children's memorial. Mm-hmm. And I'm running it. I'm doing everything cool. It's sounding great. And I mean, I'm not, to me, it's talking volume up where I'm at, which is perfect. Mm-hmm. So people can still hear because that's where the majority of the people sit. Well, the next week I get a phone call or I, I'm told that I got to turn it down. And I'm like, okay, well, come to find out that up by where I live, uh, over by the Chester, or Sarah's, at Sarah's table, the Chester Creek Cafe, apparently somebody heard the entire service both singing and the sermon while they were eating at the at the Chester Creek Cafe. The only thing I could think of is Bob Johnson would be so damn proud. And I'm like, you know, every year somebody's telling me to turn it off. This is the first time in 10 years that somebody's actually told me to turn it down. Yeah. And I'm like, I will gladly turn it down for you guys. <laughs> Turned it down and that was that. I'm like, okay. So I knocked it down a titch and everything was fine after that. Mm-hmm. That's a fabulous story, Vern. That's a an amazing story. So Tubular Studios is out for hire. If somebody's interested in hiring you out for a wedding or something, I know I did. You did an absolute amazing job. And you were so go with the flow the day of. You know, I had a few hiccups and stuff like that, but nothing was really set in stone. You're like, yeah, whatever, I'll handle it. Let's let's go. <laughs> we got this. <Yeah. laughs> Which was yep. Which is an amazing uh, feat in itself, you know, and you just make things so easy. It was great. (laughs) Thank you. But if somebody's interested in hiring you out for a wedding or maybe a CD, how can they do that? The best way to get a hold of me uh, right now um, is um, probably just via my my email because I'm I'm kind of, I've been putting kind of the actual tubular studios on the back burner a little bit Mm -hmm. Um, don't actually have a website i have a facebook page on tubular studios that you can look at you'll see some guitar tubes for my for my photo there you can message me on that um the other way that you can be done or is just email just tubular studios at gmail i do have a tubular studios.com email but it has been so inundated with the the junk and spam of the of the age that i just i don't even check it anymore so it's just easier to 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 email me at gmail.com mm-hmm. uh, on that end. But yeah, most of the weddings and stuff that I do, I, I it's really kind of funny I, for you for weddings. I actually came out of retirement on the DJing aspect um, and the emceeing stuff for you on that end. Um, <laughs> well, thank you. So I'm, I re- I'm honored. I, re- I retired from the wedding industry about eight years ago on that end. Mm-hmm. Um, and I come out of retirement for very specific people. Um, and if you ask really, really nicely um, <laughs> on that end, but you have to, you happen to have a live band on that end so it was kind of a twofer on that end because for me it's i'm not having to worry about figuring out the music aspect of it i'm just filling in gaps Mm -hmm. which uh, filling out a 20 minute gap isn't the big deal and uh darling danger was really great to work with um on that and they actually contacted me for another wedding that they've got over in iron river um but i really had a good time with them and with you at your wedding on Mm -hmm. that end and yeah it's I always learned very easily just go with the flow because um, initially I was pretty uptight and very rigid on a lot of things. I was dating somebody down back in high school when Beanie Babies were all the rage and she gave me a little Beanie Baby called River and the quote on underneath the tag just said go with the flow and it's like, you know what? Yep. And it's pretty much stuck ever since. Mm-hmm. And that's actually one of the main lessons I learned from working with you is to kind of go with the flow and roll with the punches. And, you know, you can be rigid to a point but mm-hmm. when push comes to shove ah, hands in the air let's let's go for it we got this so that yeah it's, it's not it's not it's not the end of the world if it's a deal breaker then it'll okay let it be a deal breaker but if it's if mm-hmm. it's not just go with the flow let it let it be mm-hmm. yeah you can guide the water just <laughs> go with it right exactly and now Vern, let's jump into another thing that you got going on you do leather works as well and i've been up on your website many times the stuff that you make is absolutely amazing i actually ended up ordering my husband a dice tray with his name engraved on it and everything else um which turned out absolutely beautiful he loves it and uses it 
every week for his games. Uh, but let's jump into your leatherworks a bit. This is something kind of new I discovered about you, a man of many talents. Yeah, I started um, I started Gaelic leatherworks, or if you're in, it, it, the pronunciation of, of Gaelic can be done a couple of different ways. Um, in it's really funny because if you're in actual Scotland, it's it's pronounced Gaelic, you know, like Galway girl. Uh, and it's Gaelic, but in England and in the U.S., um, they pronounce it Gaelic, and Gaelic just seems to roll off the tongue a little bit easier than Gaelic because we all know that the Scots are a little bit more harsher in their language. So, <laughs> but yeah, initially that kind of came about. I was me and my wife do Renaissance, uh, so we go to the Renaissance fair, and we, my wife, initially we went once, and my wife said, "Yeah, we got to actually come in costume because she'd gone before. I'd never been to the Renaissance festival at all." And I'm like, all right, well, this is pretty legit. And so we actually made a couple of costumes to go to the Renaissance Fair so we could actually be, be dressed up and can, can participate. Um, because a lot of people don't realize that if you go to the Renaissance Festival, which the Minnesota one is the, is the longest running one uh, in the U.S. And so if you actually are dressed up, you actually, you can, you will think the, the characters that are there that are employed by mid-america festivals will actually interact with you properly and they'll actually bring you in and speak with you in old tongue and all that stuff so you really get to play into it and it becomes a lot more fun uh, mm -hmm. on that end and so i went the first time in, in full garb and it was like holy crap this is awesome i saw some leather pieces there that you know a belt uh, a pouch um, you know a mug strap to hold your mug and I bought those to kind of help pad everything out. My wife had bought stuff for hers as well. Mm -hmm. And I started seeing stuff, and I'm like, you know, I looked at things, and I went, you know, I think I could probably make this. So I found some leather. I was actually using a sewing machine at the time to to do it. It was very, very poor, rudimentary, extremely rudimentary. But made a couple things, and uh, for me and my wife, we would still buy a couple pieces here and there at the Renaissance Festival. But over the years, over two or three years, I started making a little bit more and more, um, just one or two things. A big thing, my wife would always get a little on the on the warm side there, and so I actually made a water bottle holder. So the small little 16-ounce water bottles, I actually made a leather pouch. Um, one of the big ones I made was a, a leather pouch that would actually attach to my belt, but it actually would hold three bottles of water. Mm -hmm. that I could have for my wife. Used it one year, haven't used it since. But then, so fast forward to about two and a half years ago, now I would just happen to be surfing around on Facebook and a thing popped up on my newsfeed um, as an ad that was, that actually said, it was a website for where I got, where I get all of my leather patterns from and uh, called Creative All. And they're over in, uh, in Poland. Uh, Patrick uh, Koo is a great guy. Uh, friends with him on Facebook. He's an awesome guy. Um, he does a lot of the design work. I started thumbing through his, his website with all of his leather patterns, and I went, holy crap, these things are really awesome. Sent the link to my wife, and I said, so go through this website and find some patterns and find some stuff that you think would sell. And she said, okay. She came back, and after she came back, she sent me 43 different patterns that oh. she thought would sell. And I'm like, holy crap. So I got to work and I bought several patterns. Um, he makes tutorial videos on YouTube on how to how to make it and go from there. But uh, at that point, I just basically said, all right, well, I'm going to do something a little outlandish and, and go from there. And I made a backpack. Um, and so the very first big thing I made was was my roll top backpack. But that first one, I it was a very big learning curve. Ended up tape putting in about, I think I put in about 60 to 80 hours to make that bag. Now, if I were to make that bag, it'd probably take me probably the better part of 20, so a third of the time on that end. But yeah, I, I started it from there, and uh, and then because I didn't actually have an official website built for Tubular Studios, I just used that domain and created a subdomain for, for Gaelic. Um, so if you go to tubularstudios.com, it will actually bring you to Gaelic Leatherworks on my website, which is really kind of fun. So at some point in time here, hopefully in the near future, there will actually be an official GaelicLeatherworks.com uh, coming in. Vern, you're, you're so easy to work with, not just on the sound side, but also on the leatherworks side. I, I think I messaged, we were messaging back and forth, and I was just like, oh, could you add his name? Could you add a, a little dice engraving, da-da-da? And you're like, yeah, yeah, I can do that. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it yep. was really cool to be able to kind of customize the 
leather to fit kind of what I wanted. And the work that you have up on that website is absolutely gorgeous and, and beautiful. And mm -hmm. your your prices are actually very competitive um, compared to if you go out to Etsy or another Leatherworks, you know, a bigger kind of company. Yes, very competitive and they're even more so catered to what the person wants. If somebody's interested in seeing what you've got going or even reaching out for possibly a, a customized piece, how can they do that? The best way to do that, on my website, my website is really kind of being, it's weird and wonky. Um, I have a contact page on my website, but my contact page gets kind of really weird. I I actually have to go into the designing profile for, for like editing my website in order to check those submission forms. Oh. Um, but I did put on there that if they don't hear from me in a few weeks, if they don't hear from me, it, within two days, if they don't, if I don't, they don't get a response back, then to email me directly, which I have. Uh, that's Gaelic Leather at TubularStudios dot com. That they can email me, and it goes right to my phone, um, so I see it there. Um, I do also have a Facebook page uh, on that's Gaelic Leather Works. If you look for that, you'll see a Celtic, uh, a Celtic knot. Um, I believe it's called a Darla knot. That is a stamp. So you'll see that there. Um, and I do post. The, I, I just started that because probably about six months ago. Mm -hmm. So there's not a lot of stuff on there, but there is the link to my website uh, that you can go to. But then I'm I'm working right now on a briefcase, a laptop briefcase bag. So yeah, it's that's that's the easiest way to get a hold of me. Um, Facebook is probably probably going to be the quickest more than anything, um, which is how you got a hold of me on that end. So it's it's just really kind of a easy way to go about it. Um, and then you know during the entire process, as as you experienced. I basically just send photo progress photos. Mm -hmm. um, you know, here's it all cut out. Here's it with it punched to start new assemble, doing this, doing that. And then after a while, I tend to go a little on the dark side because once it's actually getting to a certain point, I don't want you guys to actually see it until it's actually done. Kind of like how they do on TV for the reveal. You get to see it all in pieces. And then once part of it's starting to come together, yep, starting the sewing process. And other than that, I go dark for a few. And then all of a sudden, boom, it's done. The one that I got turned out absolutely beautifully. And you allowed me to pick stains and stuff like that too. I mean, you, you definitely have a full-fledged... Uh, leather works in in your house um, that you can do for people and yeah you've got hats and bags and a couple leather garbs and things like that that's absolutely amazing where are you hoping to to bring this I'm finding that in talking with a couple of other people that, that do Renaissance stuff, the people that are cosplayers and that are are that, that do gaming and role playing games, um, Dungeons and Dragons and stuff like that, I'm finding that that is after after making that that roll dice tray for Joe, uh, your husband, I really found that and talking with some people that those those people really do understand a lot of the dynamics of leather. And mm -hmm. going from there and really making something their own. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of where I'm going to be leaning a little bit more on that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be leaning into that demograph, probably I'd say around 60, 40, okay. um, and, and trying to lean into that heavily. I'm actually working right now uh, on a dice tower that is actually a castle. So that I got, I, I got a, a, a pattern from Patrick, uh, which is a dice tower. And I'm actually modifying it a little bit because it's actually just supposed to be a stand for a leather dragon. And oh. I haven't made the leather dragon yet, but I thought, you know, I could make this into a dice tower. So there's going to be two kind of two different iterations of it. One uh, iteration is it will die, the dice will just roll out onto a mat that mm -hmm. comes out of the tower and goes onto a mat. The other iteration would actually be a tower, and then one of the windows that's on the tower would actually open up into a bigger one that you could actually put the dice tray underneath, uh, like the one I created for Joe. Mm -hmm. And it will actually roll right from the tower, out of the tower, into the dice tray oh. and go from there. So there's a lot of different things that you can do on that end. And mm -hmm. so, I mean, with that one, I'm I'm actually going in and you're actually, um, I actually went and found a, a stone pattern, uh, like a castle stone. Mm -hmm. And so I'm actually em embossing all of that onto these pieces of leather. Uh, so it will actually look like a real castle just shrunk down and and go from there so that's that's kind of the demograph that i'm going into right now really appreciate a lot of the other bags and everything there so a lot uh anybody that wants a bag i'm i'm 
I'm more than happy to to do that. Wallets are have actually been a, a pretty decent seller that I have. I have about four different types of wallets um, that I have. And speaking of wallets, you can actually pick up one of my wallets or a card holder, uh, which card holder basically will hold like a couple twenty dollar bill or a couple bills, um, and then about four or five different cards, uh, credit cards, driver's license. Down in Main Street Fashion for Men, um, they actually have some of my wallets down there for sale. And they run around 75 bucks. So yeah, Main Street Fashion for Men, you can go down and talk to Tom Henderson down there. He's one of the owners. Uh, he's also a drummer. Work with him a lot. He's a great guy. But he saw some of my work and he's like, yeah, can you make this type of wallet? And he, he I showed him one wallet and then I have a money clip one. He showed me a, a wallet that he had that's a money clip style. And he goes, we sell these all the time. And I said, yeah, I can make one of those. And uh, found a pattern, got the supplies. And I, I, I said, how many do you want? And he goes, make me three or, three or four right now. And he said, I brought down leather samples. And he's like, I want one in this color, one on this, and one like this. And I said, done. And... A week later, he had wallets down there. Excellent, Vern. That's fabulous to hear. I'm so glad. You know, it sounds like you you started off with one project and now you're into another project. I'm excited to see what happens in uh, your third iteration here. What What's that going to be? I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, I don't know either. All right. Fabulous. Vern Williams, everyone, the talented sound light engineer and now a leather master as well. Yeah, leather smith. Leather smith. All right. Well, Vern, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to talk with me and the wider world about your leather works and your sound and classic cars and everything else you got going on. Yeah, it was good good to be on and kind of just chat about life and go from there. Exactly. Shoot the shit, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I got to put one swear in there, you know. I'm, I'm kind of surprised yeah. we went the whole interview without a swear. So ah, I got to throw it in there. Oh, I, 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 I rein myself in. I could totally go British and go completely nuts, but <laughs> we'll save that for next time. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Well, have a fabulous day, and I will talk to you soon, sir. All right. You have a good day, Crystal. <laughs> yep. Bye.